and arguably one of the most decisive aircraft ever produced because it is the one that has long range. It can go all the way to Warsaw and back if you really need it to with additional fuel tanks and what have you. And that means you can escort the heavy bombers like the B-17 um, heading down the uh, uh, Stardis taxi. Um, it means it can escort those B-17s and B-24 Liberators all the way deep into the Reich. And that's key because that's where the aircraft factories are. And it's worth just pointing out in this, the 80th anniversary of D-Day, what a non-negotiable aspect of Operation Overlord um, was the reduction of the Luftwaffe over a large swage of Northwest Europe before D-Day could be launched. And the reason for that was because the moment troops land on the beaches of Normandy, then it's a race between who can build up supplies quickest. Is it going to be the Allies back in the UK getting across? In fact, James has just said to me here in the commentary box that that F-35 must be flying so slowly to fly alongside these vintage aircraft. But it is, but of course it's all flown by computers. The, the computers that control that F-35 are incredibly powerful. In fact, the aircraft physically couldn't fly without its computers. So this is the A model of the F-35. The three models we have, the F-35A with the US Air Force, the F-35B, which is flown by the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy based at RF Marham. But this is the A model, which comes from the 495th Fighter Squadron, the Valkyries at Lake and Heath. that i mean that's just amazing isn't it to see those three together the vision of them the sound of them
A big wave to John Dodd as he tacks his pass in his own P51 there. But coming in again from your right hand side, here comes our lovely formation. Led by Cam in that P47. See the vortices coming off the wingtips of that F35. So those vortices, you can see them now as as the pilot comes right into the right turn. Those vortices are produced by just such an efficient wing and the amount of lift it produces as the air detaches from the, the wing tips, you just see that beautiful vortex. He's bringing in for a few individual passes now just to give us some lovely jet noise before we go into more nostalgia. I was rather hoping he was going to, I must say. He's actually put his undercarriage down now, looking straight ahead, you can see he's configured the aircraft, he's going to give us a, a low approach to the runway. the F-35, which is the conventional takeoff and landing. The F-35B is the uh, vertical landing short takeoff version, which is what the, the UK military operates. going to pause the button on my uh, my B-17 history while we watch these amazing fighter planes take off and do that stuff. became the mainstay of the United States Army Air Corps and then Army Air Force throughout the Second World War. B-29 came in at the, towards the end of the war, but B-17 produced all the way and of course was the mainstay of the mighty 8th Air Force as well as the 15th Air Force in Italy. And just a phenomenal phenomenal aircraft again could take huge amounts of punishment but also as anyone who's seen masters of the air will know it was lethally dangerous too and it's 12 o'clock 10 meters so i think v17 is just pulling away from the p47 i we were meant to have four P-51s, but I'm looking on the flight line, I can still see one unfortunately sat on the ground, so I've only counted three airborne so far. They are going to join up and give us a nice set piece shortly, as you see John Romain and Dave Thurston taxi out in their Bouchons. I think three P-51s could take a good work with the Bouchons. 
So how old do you think the film Memphis Bell is, James? Well, I actually remember going to that, seeing that in a cinema in Poole when it first came out. So I'm going to... I reckon it was 1989? It was 1990, which makes me feel incredibly old. I actually watched it um, again not very long ago. And I have to say, I thought it really, really held up. I think it's a terrific film. Brilliant, amazing film. Did the Bombay doors open on Sally B there, just as uh, just giving us a, a belly side pass. Now, it always amazes me just how small the Bombay and those doors are on a B-17. You compare them to some of the, the Royal Air Force heavy bombers from Bomber Command, and it just amazed me that a crew of 10 in a B-17 against a crew of 7 in Lancaster, and actually the payload of a B-17 was considerably smaller. Yeah, it's, it's actually not that big for a four engine plane uh, and you're right that it can do about two two and a half tons something like that whereas a lancaster at a push could do 10. on the other hand they are designed for slightly different roles in august 1934 they wanted a bomber that's going to be able to fight 10 hours, speed of at least 200 miles per hour. Schrager music, their uh, cannons pointed upwards, so very, very underprotected. Um, but the under protection means they can take more bomb load, so it's a payoff. But you know that's why nearly 50% of all those who flew in bomber command didn't make it home. It's always a payoff. I remember talking to a crew member. Then I think he was the um, he was either the navigator or the bombardier. I can't remember. Um, on a B-17 that was, that was initially earmarked for the 8th Air Force, came over in 1942, was then sent to Northwest Africa, and a Messerschmitt 109 came in and nearly sliced, sliced off the entire tail section. But it kept on with just a thread of metal. So the wing sliced through three, more than three quarters of the fuselage just in front of the tailplane. Yeah, that's more than enough for a couple of B-shots. And they still made it home ringing. That's the amazing thing, amazing. So uh, three ship of P-51s flying past as we now see these two Bouchons rolling down runway 2-1. How can anyone say that's the ugly duck? Honestly, it's just fabulous, isn't it? A beast, but a beautiful beast.
The Bouchons, of course, built post-war by the Spanish with Merlin engines, but the Messerschmitt 109 airframe. You're getting a very good taste there of what the Messerschmitt looked like, what it could do in the air. I say is history because it was the perfect marriage and every brilliant airframe needs a brilliant power plant with it. P47 and both the Bouchons now landed. Dave and John bringing those Bouchons down very gracefully. With a crosswind, I'm told the Bouchon is a very difficult aircraft to land. I think there were quite a few landing accidents during the war with the, with the Messerschmitts and uh, it's, the crosswind makes it even trickier. So they've done very well with this crosswind here to land those very well and taxiing into park as we watch our three ship of P51s putting on quite a dazzling performance in their aerobatic routine. And Lingy, you were talking about the um, the dangers of flying the, the Messerschmitt 109, and that was certainly true. It has this terrific torque, and basically it wants to flip itself over, so you, as a pilot you've got to counteract that, and that's fine if you're incredibly experienced. What one has to remember is there aren't any two-seater fighter planes in the 1940s, so there's a sort of giant leaf of faith for your novice pilot. He's got to get in and hope that he has been listening and done his proper cockpit checks and can cope with the surprises that might be coming his way and of course the problem was that as the war progressed so the Germans ran out of fuel and so the pilots um, were put into the sky with fewer and fewer um, hours in their logbooks 
So back in 1940, a Messerschmitt 109 pilot arriving at a squadron for the first time would perhaps have maybe 150, 170 hours, and it's not 1943, that's more like 100 hours, or even less, 90. And of course it's a complete lambs and slaughter. To the beginning of March 1944, from the beginning of January 1944, the Luftwaffe lost 3,400 planes to flying accidents. And only about 2,700, only 2,700 um, in the air or in combat. So actually more than 50% due to accidents, and that is entirely because of the insufficient training of the pilots by that stage of the war. It was an absolute slaughter. Meanwhile, um, Mustang pilots and P-47 pilots were arriving into the UK with at least 350 hours on type and then they've got, you know, they're not just going to be flung into it, they've, uh, a squadron would have maybe 40 pilots to keep 16 in the air at any one time in combat. So that enables the new boys to come in and learn some of the ropes from the old hands. Then they might go on a milk run, which is what's considered to be a sort of easy operation just across the channel or something, get their hand in. So they're kind of eased into the kind of heavier combat. And of course, in every single way, that means the quality of those fighter pilots is better, but also that they're being looked after and nursed into sort of combat efficiency much better by that stage of the war. Different kettle of fish in 1940, of course, um, when the Luftwaffe has had sort of had the, the 109 since 1935 and, and uh, has a rich vein of deep experience from the Spanish Civil War and from Poland and Scandinavia and of course Battle for France and Low Countries in May and into June. So by the time they're operating over Britain in the summer of 1940, there's a big seam of great experience. But that gets whittled away as the war progresses. And of course even that experience isn't good enough to take on the home advantage, the air defense system, which is the one, only one in the world in 1940, and of course the Spitfires and Hurricanes of RAF fighter. Our P-51's coming in. The lead aircraft there is Jersey Jerk. That's a new addition to the Sywell stable here with uh, Ultimate Warbird flights, and uh, you can actually fly in the back of that aircraft. It's got dual controls, and you can actually go and fly as a passenger in that aircraft, take control yourself, have a fly of a P-51. In fact, James, you were saying your daughter has been flying in a P-51, I think? Yeah, it was a few years ago, um, but yes, and she had control. I think she was only 13 at that time, <laughs> or maybe 14. Maybe that's not the sort of thing I should be announcing publicly, <laughs> but, um, uh, but anyway, 1943, that's more like 100 hours or even less, 90. And of course, it's complete lambs and slaughter. To the beginning of March 1944, from the beginning of January 1944, the Luftwaffe lost 3,400 planes to flying accidents. And only about 2,700, only 2,700 um, in the air or in combat. So actually more than 50% due to accidents, and that is entirely because of the insufficient training of the pilots by that stage of the war. It was an absolute slaughter. Meanwhile, um, Mustang pilots and P-47 pilots were arriving into the UK with at least 350 hours on type and then they've got, you know, they're not just going to be flung into it, they've, uh, a squadron would have maybe 40 pilots to keep 16 in the air at any one time in combat. So that enables the new boys to come in and learn some of the ropes from the old hands. Then they might go on a milk run, which is what's considered to be a sort of easy operation just across the channel or something, get their hand in. So they're kind of eased into the kind of heavier combat. And of course, in every single way, that means the quality of those fighter pilots is better, but also that they're being looked after and nursed into sort of combat efficiency much better by that stage of the war. Different kettle of fish in 1940, of course, um, when the Luftwaffe has had sort of had the, the 109 since 1935 and, and uh, has a rich vein of deep experience from the Spanish Civil War and 
Poland, Scandinavia, and of course, Battle for France and Low Countries in May and into June. So by the time they're operating over Britain in the summer of 1940, there's a big theme of great experience, but that gets whittled away as the war progresses. And of course, even that experience isn't good enough to take on the home advantage, the um, air defense system, which is the one, only one in the world in 1940, and of course, the Spitfires and Hurricanes of RAF fighter. So our P-51's coming in. The lead aircraft there is Jersey Jerk. That's a new addition to the Cywell stable here with uh, Ultimate Warbird flights. and. Uh, you can actually fly in the back of that aircraft. It's got dual controls, and you can actually go and fly as a passenger in that aircraft, take control yourself, have a fly of a P-51. In fact, James, you were saying your daughter has been flying in a P-51, I think. Yeah, it was a few years ago, um, but yes, and she had control. I think she was only 13 at that time, <laughs> or maybe 14. Maybe that's not the sort of thing I should be announcing publicly, <laughs> but, um, uh, but anyway, we had quite a few. Um, so hang on to those, all your belongings. Uh, including your children if you brought them. Hang on to them. Um, I should also say that should an emergency or an, some kind of incident occur, one of two messages will be repeated and we'll repeat them regularly. And it will be all very obvious. But obviously should something happen, keep calm, stay where you are, and await further information. Or we'll be telling you to evacuate. Right, so we can see the steerman has taxied down, bit of a check of the smoke system there, and they will be getting airborne once their engine temperatures, or the engine is up to temperature. What about social media? What have we got? We've got uh, on X formerly Twitter, as the BBC always say. We have at Cywell 2024, so please do put any posts on there. Uh, the Cywell Air Show Facebook page, you will find it. It is Cywell 2024, and Instagram is the same. So please, if you have any pictures, look for the Cywell 2024 on all of those social media platforms and post all your pictures and videos, and hopefully tell them how good a day you're having here in the beautiful sunshine at Cywell. I refuse to call it X. Um, to me, it just looks like an SS collar tab, and that's all wrong. So, for me, it will always be Twitter. Should we just call it Twitter today, then? Yes. And... They take off and they intercept a big formation of B-17s and he thinks, or maybe it's Liberators, but it's American heavy bombers. And he sees that his wingman actually shoots the plane down. He thinks, oh, actually, it's good on him. You know, maybe this guy's got something else. And um, no sooner does he see the, the, the bomber going down, then he also sees his wingman going down. And he follows him down, seeing this plane, no parachute coming out, spiraling down into the ground. And he realizes it has crashed into the very field, to the edge of Hamelin, Hamel, as it is in Germany, as in the Pied Piper, where Nocker was brought up and where he was recruited by the Luftwaffe in the summer of 1939. And he flies back over the houses of Hamelin, Hamel, sees not a soul stirring and thinks, gosh, here we are, beginning of 1944. And I'm flying over my own town, and I've just seen my latest wingman go into the field. And although he was flying on the wrong side, it's impossible not to feel sorry for him. It's, uh, it's an amazing passage. And the whole book, the whole diary is just such a... It, it's just so interesting. It's so fascinating. And it's always good to see things from the other side of the hill and not look at the Second World War purely through the prism of uh, one's own national experience, I think. Plenty of amazing Allied fighter pilot memoirs, of course, as well, but behind not an Navy Zero fighter plane in the early part of the war. But it doesn't even have flat lines, it doesn't really, doesn't really prove that one of the reasons that it's so successful in the early part of the war is because those Japanese naval pilots were just so experienced, so well trained, so brilliant at what they did. But inevitably, they started to get attrited, numbers lost, 
a bit like the Germans, the training time went down as the war progressed. And a plane that was incredibly agile but very yeah, thinly okay. armoured and underarmed, while brilliant in the hands of a brilliant pilot, was not so good in the hands of an inexperienced pilot. Whilst at the same time the quality of US Navy fighter planes and the Vought Corsair that you're seeing two of them moving down the runway at the uh, flight line at the moment, yep. it's kind of sort of testimony to that. Carrier-based planes, but extremely powerful, extremely agile, extremely versatile. And just better than what the Japanese were producing by the second half of the war. Japanese as the war progresses. And I suppose one of the kind of, one of the shift over moments is what we've been seeing in June 1944. Exactly 80 years ago today, really. So there's the 46 Aviation Super Stearman getting airborne. Gentlemen, Danielle on the top there giving us a wave. Can see you waving, so please give her a big, big wave as Emiliano pulls very tight. That can't be easy for Danielle. Her leg is straight out in front of her now as he's pulling at least 4G in this aerobatic routine. Well, that's just quite extraordinary. It's, it's quite a career choice. Incredible. Of course, there is no communication between them, so they have to talk on the ground exactly what's going to happen because Danielle has to expect that really tight, hard pull as Emiliano pulls up into the, the tight vertical manoeuvres. Here they come again. Danielle waving away. Inverted flying. Give Danielle a wave, everybody. Still got her leg forward. Rather her than me. <laughs> you said it. Crikey. Now, as they come round to the left, we will eventually see Danielle moving. I don't know if it's in this manoeuvre, or she's just changing position on her harness, on the, the support at the top of the aircraft she has. She's now on top of the wing, waving. Big wave as they fly, left to right, slow speed. Now it's time for Emiliano to fly even more gently. As you can see, at the trailing edge of the wing, Danielle is actually stepping down, back in towards the cockpit, that rear cockpit, sorry, the front cockpit of the steerman. Bit of rudder to line the aircraft up on the display line. Standing on that trailing edge of the wing, holding a leg as they fly around about probably 120 miles an hour. So again, that can't be easy. And the eagle-eyed will now see she's no longer on top of the aircraft. She's back in the front cockpit. So, what's the process of getting from the top part of a wing into the cockpit? That's a very good question. I think flight. she does have a, a safety tether just to stop her falling, but she's moving all around the aircraft. And I think we're going to see something very unique for 46 Aviation, something that the other wing walking teams I've not seen do. But slow speed now coming in a bit closer as they can below 150 knots, 160 odd miles an hour. She's now standing on the wing of the aircraft. Whew. 
she is on that left wing standing giving us a wave which i think is absolutely incredible Amazed to see which part of the aircraft Danielle's gone to now. It comes in a very, very steep dive. She's now laying across the the wires holding the wings there, ladies and gentlemen, pulling up into a loop as Danielle is laying between the wings with her arm outstretched. Absolutely unbelievable. tight barrel roll there as well as Daniela is still laid there I think she's starting to move again now you can see her standing back on that lower wing she'll start positioning back towards the cockpit I assume nope I'm wrong she's actually gone even further out on the wing by the looks of it Everybody, slow speed pass, let's give her a huge wave. Danielle's website does say, for those in the crowd who have got that smoke blowing towards them, it does say that it is environmentally friendly. I should point that out. If you're worried about that smoke that's coming over from that low speed pass, it is environment, our environmentally friendly smoke, so don't worry about that. Well, that requires a special kind of courage, wouldn't you say? I mean, how remarkable. And a lot of faith in your husband. If you're telling me. Now, I think this is even crazier. Ladies and gentlemen, get your cameras out. Danielle is hanging upside down from that lower wing with her arms outstretched. <laughs> that cannot be comfortable. Impressive stomach muscles as well. Climbing back up now. Just think about when you're travelling on the on a road and driving at 60 or 70 miles an hour and you put your arm out, just how much force is required to keep your arm from flailing back. Just imagine what Danielle is coping with up there at speeds of 150 plus miles an hour and in that pass probably around about maybe 90, 100 miles an hour as she's hanging upside down from that lower wing. So brilliant stamina I would suggest and as you said, strong core.
haven't been fortunate enough. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. I wasn't expecting that, but why not? Now for something completely different. Well, they, they say it's all about communication, James, and uh, we clearly don't have any communication with the control tower because uh, this aircraft was actually due in... Um, in fact, that's a little bit early. Yeah, that's how bad. We've actually been talking about those guys, but they're holding over this, so that's a little slip up on our part. Well, like the uh, Lingy, we're, we're, we're swift to respond <laughs> in any situation that's come our way. So I apologise for that, ladies and gentlemen. We do have uh, the seven... Uh, the Wildcat peeling off from the back of the formation to put on his solo performance.
And I'm here now with uh, Roland White, author of Vulcan 607, of course, most recently Mosquito, um, and a big fan of all these planes. And also, you, you published um, Carrier Pilot. Indeed. Uh, Norman has this Carrier Pilot. Very, very pleased to be able to bring back into print after discovering it as a teenager back in the 80s. Now, this is the Wildcat we're looking at here, the Martlet uh, in British service. Uh, was a great relief when it uh, entered service with Fleet Air because uh, the naval uh, air service was struggling um, with aer to find aeroplanes that could match uh, the performance of uh, the land-based air power that it was, uh, it was coming up against. Uh, and uh, Winkle Brown, perhaps our most famous naval aviator, reckoned the Martlet was uh, up there with his, his very favourite aeroplanes. It's, uh, the, the machine he scored his first kills in, uh, shot down Condor over the Bay of Biscay um, before the... He was on an escort. Well, he was on an escort carrier, which the first escort carrier, um, which uh, was, uh, was sunk by a uh, U-boat shortly afterwards. But he, he retained a fondness for the Martlet for the rest of his life. Um, and, uh, you know, his performance, as James said, uh, was not exceptional, but it was good. Uh, and that was exactly what the fleet air arm needed in 1940, uh, when it was struggling with uh, sea gladiators and uh, full Mars, none of which could really match the um, the machines it was pitted against. And very manoeuvrable, isn't it? Uh, very, very manoeuvrable, and, and like the rest of the Grummers, and the Hellcat, uh, which uh, was the sort of the, the machine which sat in between the Wildcat and the, the Bearcat, uh, was responsible for more. Uh, American kills than any other aeroplane in US service uh, out over the Pacific against the Japanese. So the, this um, family of Grumman naval fighters uh, was hugely, hugely successful. Rugged and, uh, and I mean Grumman went on, uh, you know, after the Second World War to go and build um, the Tomcat of, uh, of Top Gun fame. So really close association with naval aviation for decades. And the Martlet obviously wearing the, um, the white and black uh, D-Day stripes. So although uh, it was um, uh, quickly superseded by, uh, by, by newer, superior uh, aeroplanes throughout the war, it was still serving uh, all the way through the, uh, the Second World War. From the left, originally, let's just listen to them. Originally, the, the Corsair was not uh, particularly well regarded by the U.S. Navy. Uh, that long nose, it has the shape of a, of a racing aeroplane. That long nose made it difficult to land on a carrier. Um, but the British didn't have the luxury of choice um, and were the first to press it into service with the Royal Navy. And as James said earlier, uh, it fought in the European theater um, off Norway, where it provided um, flak suppression support for the attacks on the Tirpitz. Um, but it, it um, really made its name in the Pacific theater with both the Royal Navy, the Australian Navy too, um, and the US um, Pacific Fleet. I've got to say, I'm a big fan of the Corsair. I just think it looks good, um, sounds good, uh, and it's just amazing to see. And I really go with that, that rule of thumb that if it looks good, it probably is good. I mean, it doesn't always work out, but for the most part it does. Nine times out of ten. Wow. Yeah, what's not to like? So James, do you know, do you know when the Corsair scored its last aerial victory? No, but it must be Korea or something. 1969. <laughs> The football war. The football war. The Corsairs came up against Mustangs um, in skies over Central America, war between uh, Honduras and, and El Salvador. So the last Corsair kill, the, I think the last Mustang kill too, uh, uh, took place in 1969. Well, what do you know?
And now it's just a classic fight, sight, isn't it? The three fighters coming out of the sun. Of course, those, um, those gull wings uh, are only that shape so that um, the wheels could, uh, could touch the deck and clear the huge propeller. Uh, that, that powered those Corsairs. privilege to see three of them flying together like that. Very fortunate to see that. It's just a great aircraft, isn't it? It really is. Yeah, it's such a, I mean, it's one of the things which um, is so striking about the speed um, and innovation that we saw through the, uh, the late 30s and the early years of the Second World War was that each, each company was coming up with its own solution to the aerodynamic and technical challenges involved of achieving high performance. And, and what Grumman did, oh sorry, what um, uh, uh, Consolidated did with this is really, uh, it was really fantastic. So, so unusual, so striking. That would be bought, of course, rather than Consolidated. Wildcat, no, the Hellcat rather, uh, was the one which bore the brunt of the fighting, obviously. Yeah, it took over from the Wildcat, didn't it? But the Bearcat, it's a Here it is, here it comes. This is quick, really quick. We're just going to shut up now. folks really is the pinnacle of piston engine fighter design this along with the sea fury really really represent the the top of the tree in fact as far as i know the the bearcat still now holds the current piston engine world speed record and you can see why i think at a at around 500 miles an hour uh, straight and level which is you know that's jet speed in fact talking to i mean as i said this and the sea fury really peas in a pod and uh I was talking to a sea fury pilot who said um, you know, flying these things it's really like flying the jets in terms of the performance uh, that you have on tap here it comes What a plane that is. But 
but it feels like it's the, the least amount of, of airframe you can fit around a huge radial piston engine, isn't it? I mean, it's sort of shrink wrap to fit. Yeah, it's small and dinky and nimble as hell, isn't it? Compared to a Sea Fury. Compared to a Sea Fury. As James mentioned, uh, these Bearcats served all the way through into the 50s, and so it meant that you know that first generation of, uh, of Gemini and Mercury astronauts, those Navy pilots who, who who led the space race, they would have learned to fly on machines like the Bearcat. In fact, Winkle Brown, I know, uh, flew Bearcats. Uh, alongside some of those early astronauts when he was on exchange um, in the United States at Patuxent River. Another favourite of his. I think it's all service till 1963 um, in the US. And actually, you can see why, can't you? <laughs> they didn't want to get rid of it. Why would you? You do something now, really. Anything would do. <laughs> yes. Dust down the Harriers, a few bear cats. Maybe some, maybe even some. Well, you laugh, but <laughs> maybe some English electric lightnings as well. And even in those uh, sort of transitional years between the uh, piston engine, the um, Bearcats, Sea Furies, even the, and in fact, particularly the uh, the Sea Fire 47, which was a contemporary. I've not managed to fly a hurricane myself, but when I spoke to Trevor this morning, he talked about that high speed entry for that loop. He said, we need to get it going as fast as we can to enable us to have the performance for a loop. And he said, in this aircraft, when you get it going as fast as you think you've got it, it starts shaking, that sort of wooden fabric fuselage starts shaking, and you think you're going really fast, and then you look in, and actually you're still only at around about 200 miles an hour, so you've got to go faster still. So he says, it's very, very different to flying a Spitfire. And of course, the Hawker Hurricane really is a development of the biplanes they were producing in the early 1930s. You know, the Hawker Hart, Fury, Nimrod, and so on. If you look at them in, 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 in profile, you can see that the fuselage shape is pretty much the same. The tailplane is pretty much the same. And actually, the, um, the cowling is much the same as well. It's just it's got enclosed cockpit, and it's a monoplane. And it's got a bigger engine. But what that does mean, of course, is that when you're trying to suddenly increase production dramatically, 
a lot of the machine tools and the know-how are already in place. And it's actually the creating the machine tools is half the thing. That's one of the things that's most expensive in a new aircraft production. And the Spitfire, by contrast, is completely new. Everything about it is new. It's completely unique to the Spitfire. Whereas lots have taken over bits, you know, copied from earlier models. And that does mean that while it's sort of rooted in an earlier generation of aircraft, it is also easier to quickly produce in numbers. And they more than performed a job in 1940. And frankly, the country owes a debt to the hurricane out of all proportion to its brilliance as a fighter aircraft. And all those that flew it, of course. Well, one of the stark differences between the Hurricane and the Spitfire is this, the, the, the thickness of the wing. If you look at the front of a Hurricane, the thickness of the profile of that wing, is it's much, much thicker on a Hurricane and clearly much, much thinner on a Spitfire. And uh, one of the challenges they had with the Spitfire was trying to fit all of the armament and, of course, the undercarriage, the retractable undercarriage, into the wing. So that was one of the challenges they faced. But some brilliant design, and they obviously achieved it. Well, yeah, thank goodness. And... Um... You know, that famous elliptical wing would never have been designed if, if the uh, requirement had been to have cannons which are much bigger and chunkier than machine guns. Both the uh, Hurricane and the Spitfire are equipped with eight Browning .303 machine guns. <laughs> and they could store enough ammunition to fire for 14.7 seconds continually which I'm sure you'll agree is not very much. Whereas the Messerschmitt 109 had 55 seconds worth of machine gun ammunition. Which obviously gave it a little bit of an advantage. It's an ME 109E, I should say, the ME on. What that also means is the, the eight Brownings on the Hurricane could be much closer together because of the thickness of that wing. Whereas in the Spitfire, they have to be spread out. climbing four-point roll there from Paul as he puts this Fury through its paces. 
lot of you will know the name Paul Bonham from his experience flying many, many warbirds in the air show scene, but also as the world champion of the Red Bull Air Race when it was flying in its guise as the Red Bull Air Race back in the mid 2000s. with the roll rate of the Fury here as, as Paul flies it you can see him doing those rolls it's a, a very crisp aileron so the roll rate looks very impressive as as Paul flies it through this display Absolutely magnificent, isn't it? And um, I've been following the restoration of this this amazing aircraft and watching Richard Grace and his team put it back to pieces over the last few years and it's just brilliant to see it flying again and doing what it should be doing, which is manoeuvring around the sky very noisily and very fast. On such a perfect afternoon. I was just thinking, watching these how walks. good that topside pass looked with the with the cloud behind and the, the blue canvas. It's just fantastic and gorgeous afternoon for watching an air show. Has to be said. Well, this is payback for the endless rain we've had since last October. I'm going to milk every moment of it personally. <laughs> I think that might be Paul finished. It looks like he's configuring <laughs> and positioning. So that was a, just a <laughs> tremendous display. Up next, uh, we have something slightly different. So far, lots of warbirds, a bit of jet noise. But coming up, we do have an extra 330 flown by Melanie Astor as she shows us what high-performance aerobatic aircraft can actually do. the tail and straight away airborne. Yeah. Very quick at climbing, very quick at accelerating. It'll test the controls there so she just applies full forward and full aft elevator control. You just see the nose of the aircraft nodding up and down as she's Test the aeroplane, now an inverted flight check, so up and down, make sure there's no loose articles in the cockpit. Testing her straps are all secure, ready for what are, quite frankly, some very crazy aerobatic manoeuvres. And what is it about this aircraft that makes it quite so manoeuvrable? Super light, so it's, it probably weighs around 750 kilograms, 330 horsepower in the engine, massive propeller, uh, huge control surfaces, so the ailerons which control the roll and on uh, each trailing edge of the, uh, the wing. You've got a huge elevator and a huge rudder, and it just makes it so controllable. And what we're going to see today is some what we call gyroscopic aerobatics. So Melanie will actually be using the gyroscopic effects of the engine. Big wave for Paul as he taxes the Fury past us. Yeah, so we'll see some gyroscopic aerobatics from Melanie as she uses that power in the engine and the gyroscopic properties of the propeller to actually help control and fly some of the maneuvers. So you'll be seeing that in from around 3,000 feet. Crazy rolls in the extra. Those ailerons I talked about, very big on each end of the wing. The aircraft can actually roll at 400 degrees a second. That's what she was just demonstrating. Here we go again. So rolling towards us. Vertical climb, rolling in the vertical. 
Low rolling now, reversing the turn. Now she's going to position into a flat spin now. So you can see the aircraft is purely flat as she spins back towards the earth. Recovers from that. 90 degrees nose down. Pitching hard as she pulls out. Back onto the display line into a four-point roll. How many G's is she pulling at that point? Oh, probably at the recovery of that vertical dive, maybe around about 6G. The aircraft is actually stressed to plus 10G. Little Ruard at the top there, little tumble. Onto the 45 down. Upside down now. I talked about stress to plus 10G. More alarmingly, the aircraft is actually stressed to minus 10G. So you can push minus 10G in this aircraft. Now this is pulling up into the vertical. Goodness. Into what we call a knife edge spin. So now on the knife edge, so the wing pointing down as she spins the aircraft back down into the vertical. There, snap there. You see the kink in that smoke as she's pulling very hard, probably around 5G to recover that manoeuvre. Hesitation roll on the way out, called the B axis, so the crowd front 90. And how much is it nerves, skill? physical practice. strength practice and skill and and quite a lot of physical strength you know, to counter the g-force Melanie's working very hard so that is a minus seven minus seven turn there i talked about it being stressed to minus 10 so at plus seven so seven times the force of gravity everything gets heavier the blood wants to go out of your head but you can strain against it at minus seven there's nothing you can do to stop that blood rushing to your head so into a tail slide that was a torque roll and tail slide So is the engine actually cutting out at that point? No, the, the engine's probably staying, depending on what she's doing. It's, if Some manoeuvres you will use the throttle to help the performance of the aircraft. That gyroscopic uh, properties of the propeller I talked about. So rolling circle now. You can see Melanie's going to perform a 270 degree turn as she rolls the aircraft around its longitudinal axis. Now in on the crowd front 90 to the B axis. Upside down, this is going to be a push away. So again, around about minus six, minus seven, she pushes into an inverted or an outside half loop, a flick roll at the top, and then keeps climbing as she turns to the right. You can see there that power of the engine against this very light airframe. And all this negative and positive G, I mean, what does that do to the body and, and how tiring is it? But it's very tiring. So the positive G when you're straining against it, trying to stop that blood rushing to your feet and out of your vital organs. She's working very hard against that positive G. Not a lot you can do for the negative. It just sends all those... Uh, you've been on a roller coaster and you get those weird speckles in your eyes after you go over a, a humpback bridge or a roller coaster. It's exactly what's happening as you push negative G. So stationary flight now, hovering on the propeller. Very little forward speed. Back down onto the vertical and recovering around 6G onto the display line. I think this might be the freestyle element now. She's climbing up through the vertical for a half loop. Nice tumble there. So you can see there the aircraft is completely departed as it flies up, but the beauty of the extra, because those control surfaces are so big, and they all sit in the slipstream of that big propeller and that 330 horsepower engine. The spin recovery to recover from any departed flight is very instantaneous. You just almost centralize the controls and tell the aeroplane to stop and it just does what you tell you. It's a fantastic aeroplane for these type of aerobatics. Big snatch there, you see the kink in the smoke, probably around about a 7, 8G pull into the vertical. A Lomshevac on the way up, so Again, departing the aircraft on the way up the hill. Lomshevac meaning hangover in Czech. You can see why the effect that would have on the body, throwing the aircraft around like that. Engine sounds like it cuts. But it's not cut. It's not cut, no. It's just uh, maybe a reduction in throttle, which just changes the sound of the, the engine of the propeller. And if you wanted to buy one of these extras, you know, how much, how much would you have to have in your current account? Uh, I think an early model you might get for... £150,000, perhaps? Yep. So when, when do they first start getting produced? 
That is a very good question. I don't have those. Probably do they, are they sort of 70s, 80s? Uh, probably in the 80s for when the first design came for the competition aerobatics and they've just been developed. The newest version is called the Extra NG, the next generation or new generation. So coming down the line now, slow roll. So using her hands and feet to coordinate the controls into fast roll to finish into slow roll. Slow roll, because of the, the way the aircraft wants to drop as you roll slowly, you have to use your feet coordinated with your hands. As the aircraft rolls, you use the rudder to keep the fuselage in the position you want it to keep the aircraft level. So a lot of coordination during a slow roll using hands and feet. It's going to come in for a knife edge. Now this is a good time for cameras and get your arms ready boys and girls big wave to Melanie as she flies in right to left bit of crazy flying again using the entire rudder there that massive rudder on the trailing edge of the tail as i mentioned before in the slipstream of that propeller so you can get a huge amount of control authority from the rudder which enables the aircraft to fly a very steep knife edge almost 90 degrees of flight i mean that is unbelievable skill isn't it it, as I said before, a lot of practice. So actually, Melanie has been uh, flying for a long time. She's got four and a half thousand hours. She has six French titles to her name and a UK title in varying levels of competition aerobatics. In fact, she was the only female to compete in the Red Bull Air Race. The eagle-eyed amongst you might see under the wings are kind of almost paddles sticking down connected to those ailerons I talked about for roll control. I'll let Melanie do her next maneuver then explain what they are. You can just see the silhouette of them now underneath those are the red panels underneath. Another wave in that knife edge. So those panels, they're called aileron spades. They are connected to the ailerons and they stick out into the airflow. So if you can picture putting your hand out of a car window on a motorway, if you held your hand perfectly level, it would stay where it was. The second you lift or drop your fingertips, the airflow would push your hand down. And that's what's exactly happening with those aileron spades. Connected to the ailerons in the airflow, as soon as you move them away from the horizontal, they get caught by the airflow and give you a very crisp response in your aileron control. So essentially it's like power steering for the ailerons, which is what gives the aircraft that very rapid, crisp roll rate. And as I said, 400 degrees a second, which is uh, quite phenomenal when you're trying to do a 360 roll and stop exactly wings level. But Mike, I mean, you're talking about uh, all the skill and how much practice goes into this, but you're still ultimately one person in a single seat of plane. So is it just a case of, okay, I can, I can do this roll and perhaps push it a little bit harder and a bit harder and a bit harder. I mean, it, it seems that to me, as a sort of layman, that that would require a huge amount of faith in your growing abilities and a, and, a, and a certainly, you know, you have to be careful not to get too cocky. I mean, these planes are still machines and, you know, you start taking liberties, it all goes wrong, doesn't it? Absolutely. So in, in Melanie's case, she started at the, the sort of grassroots level of competition aerobatics. again but the p38 is just an absolutely awesome machine particularly to see when flying it's um they're coming over from the right of us as we're looking out towards the runway at the moment uh, so they'll be coming in from that side but here they are coming in now all four of them together 
What an amazing sight. So B25 up front, Mustang on the left, Corsair on the right, P38 at the back. The P38 of course is by Lockheed, we just saw the Electra earlier on and you can see the heritage I think. The Mitchell is also um, North American, named after Billy Mitchell, one of the great pioneers of, um, of United States aviation in the 1920s and 1930s. Infamously court-martialed for calling out the U.S. Navy uh, and ruined, effectively. But um, a brilliant man and, and a pioneer of air power and of one of the early bomber men. Um, some of the great aviators and um, aviation commanders, air leaders of the United States Army Air Force in the Second World War, people like Tui Spots. Hap Arnold, who was the uh, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Army Air Force. Ira Aker. To name but three, they were all kind of disciples of, of Billy Mitchell. The B-25 could get up to, uh, you know, 200 70 to 180 miles an hour if it really needed to kind of cruising speed of 230 which is pretty nimble very versatile i was talking earlier on about the need to destroy bridges and marshalling yards in advance of d-day an absolute non-negotiable prerequisite for that um, operation across the channel the actual invasion itself had to clear that airspace had to slow up the german ability to reinforce the bridgehead once it was formed in Normandy and it was those medium bombers like the B-25, like the B-26 that were doing the hard yards, flying in low at kind of, you know, 1,000 feet, 2,000 feet, bombing from very, very low heights with incredible precision. And this plane amazingly was flying operationally until 1979. Still being used in Korea and Vietnam War. Wow. A breaking way to do its own display now. And honestly, people, we're really lucky to see it fly. You know, there's so few of them left now. Just a sniff under 10,000 built ever. And it's always the heavies that get all the glory, really. The B-17 flying fortresses, the Liberators to a lesser extent, and of course the B-29 Super Fortress. But these medium bombers were awesome, it's particularly so in the second part of second part of the war. And Allied air power was really ruling the roost. Served all around the globe, all theatres, Italy, Africa, Far East, and of course Northwest Europe as well. I always give you goosebumps watching it, James. It's a, just a beautiful aeroplane. It's been flown today by Frederick Handelman, one of the Flying Balls pilots who also flies the, the Flying the fly Balls DC-6, and he's uh, very much enjoying flying this today. Yeah, I mean, look at it. You can see how kind of manoeuvrable it is. I mean, it's really much more... I mean, it's a bomber, for goodness sake. And look at it, how it's sort of flitting around the sky. I mean, really pretty delicately, isn't it? You know, I see that and I just think of these planes flying in formation over France, in, I don't know, early May 1944, ahead of the invasion, to attack some bridge over the River Loire or something, you know, coming in low. And the amazing thing is that these bombers, these twin engine bombers like the Mitchell, destroyed every single bridge over the River Seine.
was by the middle of April 1944, the fighter planes and the heavy bombers really had enabled the skies to be clear of Luftwaffe fighter planes over much of Northwest Europe. By the middle of April, the biggest danger to these planes flying in the months just within the weeks just before D-Day was really from flak anti-aircraft guns on the down below and of course if you're operating at such low heights you've got very little room for maneuver if anything goes wrong but their speed and their agility certainly counted you know obviously it's much harder for anti-aircraft guns to hit something that's moving fast and they were incredibly successful Another major operation was was Operation Strangle, which was in April 1944 in Italy, ahead of the last major attack, Operation Diadem, the Battle for Rome, which was launched on the night of the 11th of May 1944. And Operation Strangle was, as its name suggests, all about, again, inhibiting the Germans' ability to reinforce the front, destroying railway lines, blowing up bridges, hitting marshalling yards, and yet again, the Mitchells and the other medium bombers were mainstays of this, operating very successfully in the Mediterranean. I think that's so lush, I've just had to take a pause from the commentary, which I'm sure you'll agree is no bad thing, and take a little bit of video footage of that, because that is super special seeing that. Really is just a wonderful sight. It didn't work. You know, this is it's horses for courses, isn't it? And an engine that doesn't work in one plane can work brilliantly in another, and P-38 is a case in point, really. So from the right hand side, camera's ready for another pass by the Flying Bulls. That you get from the three wings rather than two. I don't know if they've got control services on all of that. I don't think they, uh, they didn't have them, but uh, I'll have to go down on the flight line and have a good look at that aircraft this afternoon when it's landed. I mean, it does look a bit like a box kite, doesn't it? Absolutely, and as I said, it smelt like a model aircraft. To admit, it looks a bit like one as it's flying around. they have been expertly flown by Mikhail Carson there. Yeah, I've mentioned his name already, so that's uh, Stu Goldspink in the the sense that with the advent of the D7 just as production of the D DR1 the triplane here is coming to an end you see one kind of step forward taking over from another fabulous to see though you know what I really enjoyed that just yeah, how you tight that display was uh, just really gracefully flown fantastic performance so ladies and gentlemen please put your hands together for Mikhail Carson and Stu Goldspink in their Fokker DR1s and D7s just marvellous so I know we had two Spitfires get airborne I've just heard Spitfire check in on the sidewall display frequency 
I haven't counted them all out, but if we look over towards the hard runway, certainly one, two, three, four in view at the moment. Five, six, seven. We have seven Spitfires taxing out. Such a big place in cultural history, military history, a huge place in the hearts of, I'm sure, of everyone who's here today. They are amazing aircraft, a wonder to behold. The side of the world in the side of the Griffin as well. We're going to be seeing some Griffin engine um, Spitfires as well. Increased horsepower. And of course, the fact that you can have these up engined Spitfires coming into like that. Coming into service in the middle of the war is testimony to the fundamental brilliance of the design that you can adapt it. It's in many ways a completely different aircraft, but it looks absolutely distinctively like a Spitfire, whether it's a Mark 1 or whether it's a Mark 22 or whether it's a Mark 14 with a big Griffin engine in it. No one can mistake a Spitfire when they see it. Even the ones with the elliptical wings cut off. The amazing thing is that, of course, RJ Mitchell is rightly lauded as uh, chief designer of Supermarine and the inventor of the Spitfire, but it's very much a team effort down there. So as the other seven get airborne from your right hand side, these beautiful FR-14s. Very different sound to the Griffin engine. FR fighter reconnaissance, so the fighter reconnaissance version. For those who saw the aircraft taxi out from the flight line, big porthole windows on the sides of the fuselage for the reconnaissance cameras, but they were also armed, whereas one of the other aircraft that just got airborne was a PR-11, so a photo reconnaissance wasn't armed at all, just a photo reconnaissance aircraft, unarmed. But this is an FR, the fighter reconnaissance version. And it's important to remember that it wasn't just Mitchell, there was a team of designers. Mitchell. Talking about designers and Spitfire related, a little pub quiz fact for you. Do you know who designed the undercarriage for the Spitfire? I don't. So, Mr. Owen McLaren. So, those of you in the audience who have had children and McLaren buggies, after he designed the undercarriage for the Spitfire, which had to fit very neatly into that very thin profile wing I talked about earlier, he went on to design folding push chairs. That could fit into the back of a Nissan <laughs> Micro. Exactly. Or a Mini. <laughs> there you go, pub quiz fact. But actually, Beverly Shenstone was Canadian and um, had actually done some time working with Junkers in the late 1920s, early 1930s, before coming back to the UK and joining Supermarine. And of course, Supermarine, as the name suggests, were primarily um, creating and designing and building flying boats. So creating the Spitfire, a modern single-engine fighter plane was a departure in many ways. Another pass in from the right. What sort of speed are they doing there, Mike? It looked around sort of 250, 280, somewhere between. Um, nothing aerobatic so far they i can hear the on the radio the other seven are joining up into formation we're going to get a, a real treat of a nine ship fly past when the uh, the griffin powered well, those griffin engine spitfires they can do well over 400. oh easily absolutely they are that was the difference between the mark one up to the later marks as you just said all right it looks like the griffin aircraft are now peeling out to the south where i'm sure if you look behind you you can see seven aircraft already in formation those two 14s are going to join into the rear vic so the uh, the three ship is called a vic vic formation and there are three of those once the other two aircraft join at the back being led expertly by paul bonham who you saw displaying the fury earlier on he's the leader of this nine ship 
So in the lead we have a Mark 9, MH434. In the number two position, Nick Smith, he is flying a Mark 5, EE602. In the number three position, there's that PR11 I talked about. That is being flown by Martin Overall. Here we go. Here we go. Coming in from the right hand side at the front, seven Merlin powered Spitfires. Get ready, people. Ribbons, and I'm going to keep quiet now, I think. All aboard was the call there, so we're joining up into those three Vicks I mentioned earlier. Number four position flying EP120, a Mark V Spitfire is Rolf Muren. And reversing to the left calls Paul in the lead there. Letting it out a bit, you heard Paul on the radio there. Letting it out means he's just releasing the back pressure on the control column, so less G. So he's catering for the wind there. What he doesn't want is the wind blowing the formation towards the crowd and coming closer than he's allowed, as dictated by the rules of, from the Civil Aviation Authority. So letting it out a bit, as he said, around the back, just means he can fly the formation without getting affected by the wind and blowing over the crowd line. Amen. And now tightening, that's the opposite. He's pulling back on the stick just to pull a little bit more G and tighten the turn to complete this fly past. right said Paul in the middle of the formation furthest away from us now but in the middle on the right hand side is George Hay flying his Suffolk Spitfire RW382 that's a Mark 16 and on the left wing of that middle formation is Ben Cox flying in ML407 known as the Grace Spitfire a two-seat two version of the Mark 9 leading the back three in a Mark 9 is Dan Griffith and then he's joined by Alex Smee and Bryce O'Hare in the FR14s. This is the last pass of the formation, says Paul. After this, we'll be powering up for tail chase. So, in from the right. Doing good that I've got goosebumps. I'm sure many people in the audience have goosebumps too, but that sound is incredible, truly magical. Powering up for tail chase now, they're going to split the formation complex in itself to try and get nine aircraft, 
now into a tail chase. So that's what they're doing over to our front left. I talked about tail chasing and the intricacies of using lead and lag geometry to keep in the formation. But Paul now going to lead a nine ship tail chase. That just doesn't look real. It looks like one of those photoshopped pictures where you see one aircraft and time stills of the photos, but it is real, ladies and gentlemen. A treat. No, here's a Vic of three. Look at that. I'll come back to the wings in a minute. Let's just watch this for the moment.
It's crazy. Expertly flown, led by Paul Bonner on MH434. Nick Smith in the number two position, and Ralph Murray in the number three position for some three ship formation aerobatics to almost round off the Spitfire finale. But we do have MH434 right to left, ML407, sorry, the Grace Spitfire flown by Ben Cox showing off those D-Day invasion stripes, those black and white stripes. She's been painted in those this year to recognize the 80th anniversary of D-Day. forget you can fly in this very aircraft here at Cywell. warbirdflights.co.uk the back seat gives you a feeling of what it was like for all of those pilots during the second world war flying the spitfire you will have a magical time it's a true honor to fly this aircraft and to give those passenger experiences and the number of people that get emotional is astounding privilege of flying aircraft that have such pedigree now this this very aircraft you're watching display now and that you can go flying in was the very first aircraft on the 6th of June 1944 to shoot down an enemy aircraft over the beaches of Normandy on D-Day it's a very airplane it's also one of the most original still flying and this this plane has so much history in it it really does it's it's an absolute remarkable machine most fighter pilots felt that the Mark 9 was the fighter pilot's mark. I mean, I think it's the one that was most produced. 